Do you see that sounds? It's a little sibilant. Can you lower the high end? Thank you. Wow, she's bossy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Canadian. <laughs> Looking for a way to dump her for the kids now. <laughs> this is the end of our longest day today. Yeah. We're still a little tiny bit jet lag, so we're a little bit like, ee, ee, ee. You don't know what's going to come out of our house. So make sure you ask some really good questions so that you don't know what you're going to get. Because <laughs> anything goes now. Are we starting? I don't know. Should we start? Yeah. Okay, it's 7 o'clock, I guess. Yeah. Go. 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 I got to start the high side. I'm going to go. Uh, I guess I'll start off. Uh, my name is John Stocker. Uh, the three of us have uh, come in to, uh, from Toronto uh, to be with you folks. Thank you very, very much. We uh, have come in primarily as uh, cast and crew of Sailor Moon. Uh, I was the voice director of Sailor Moon. Right. Uh, thank you. Uh, but we're, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll pass it on in a second, but we know that the, the, the topic of today's, uh, today's uh, session is voiceover uh, acting and anime acting through the years. So anyway, I'll just pass it on in terms of introduction uh, to the lady to my life. I'm Linda Valentine, and I was the voice of Sailor Moon in the series. All right! Yes. <laughs> and right now, I'd really love to be knitting right beside you. <laughs> I don't know why, it just looks so nice and relaxing. <laughs> um, it, we're going to be opening it up, like we said, but right now. Uh, I am Susan Roman, mm -mm -mm, the voice of Sailor Jupiter. So, and you were a very, very excellent knitter, I can, I can tell. So, yeah, sorry. Yeah, it's any consequence, you're not making me want to knit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'd let you play with it, but I'm making this one better. Oh, oh that's nice. nice. For his birthday, or just, for, just because? Christmas. Christmas, so you're a slow knitter. Can you imagine <laughs> knitting in Texas? The heat? The heat, yeah. The heat, and you're knitting a scarf right now. You I have a this. very large family, so I have a lot of scarves to knit. Um, okay. You know what we're going to do, um, or we thought, um, would be to let you guys ask some questions and that may, you know, kind of lead us on to something. Sorry, I'm sounding so simple. Yikes. It's driving me crazy. Just really lower that top end. Oh, that's better. See that? The power of technology. Thank you, John. That was perfect. So, um, we would like you to ask some questions that you, especially about voice work. I mean, a lot of people have been asking how to get into it, etc., etc. but here I am, I'm struggling with this microphone. So in case you have, and, but I'm not anymore, but in case you have any questions that you would like to ask about the technical aspect of it, uh, how you do it, um, the various kinds of, of, of animation uh, that are done nowadays or before, because this of course is a perspective, please feel free to ask away. Because anytime anybody asks a question, it sparks another idea. So just jump in. And just to let you know, you can go back, because a um, couple of us, both Susan and I, uh, were very, very active uh, through the 80s when there was, uh, uh, as you know, animations suddenly burgeoned. Uh, and, uh, and there was a lot of activity in the 80s. Uh, animation wise. And Toronto was very, very busy. Still today remains probably the most active animation city in North America. Uh, there's 25, 30 animated shows going on in Toronto at any given time, certainly right now. Anyway, so you can go back uh, and delve into the into either our histories, the history of animation, uh, wherever we can uh, you know, where we can help out with, we will. Uh, and Linda, you started in when? Ninety-ish. Ninety-ish. Yeah. Five. So yeah. So we're all uh, we're all kind of old timers in the game, but still all very current. So questions. Yes. What are some of your favorite vocal warm-up techniques? Oh, that's a good question. What a good question. Now, are you a performer yourself? No. 
And you came up with that question. <laughs> Are you a writer? Sometimes. Singer. No, not anymore. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. That, that is such a great question, because everybody has their own way of warming up. And you have to warm up. It's, it's, I kind of dislike when they call sessions for 9 o'clock in the morning, because it means I have to get up around 5 so that I can warm up my voice. If the session is called, <coughs> pardon me, if the session is called for 2 o'clock in the afternoon, I have all morning, I can be chatting. I, I like to, to actually talk to other people on the phone. That helps me warm up a lot. Um, you don't have a very cold winter here, where I, in Toronto it gets cold and it gets dry because of the central heating. So your voice gets dry. There's a thing called um, Las Vegas voice. And all singers and performers who go to Las Vegas have to put humidifiers into their rooms at all times. Because dryness is really, really bad for your vocal cords. So that's what happens in Toronto. You have to have a humidifier on your furnace. In the morning, in the winter, I'll get up, I'll put the kettle on, I'll fill a pot with water, go into the kitchen. All sorts of steam is coming into the room. Of course, a, a, a hot steamy shower is essential. And then as I'm driving to work, that's, and I, I warm up in the shower, of course. But then when I'm driving to work, I'll recite party pieces, that's audition pieces, that I used to use when I was going to uh, auditioning to go to theater school. So I'll just do these pieces uh, all the way to the end, and so you can see me driving along the highway in Toronto at any time, going like this. And so, Gertrude, I really wish that you were speaking to Tommy Traffic. Well, Tommy has proposed to me again. Tommy really does nothing but propose to me. He proposed to me last night in the musical when I was quite unprotected. So you can see me chatting away through every window in my car. But the thing is, is that it's all getting warmed up, right? And so that when I get there, I'm not going to be, you know, coughing and, and working. Oh, Do you understand okay. that one? <laughs> and I'll just... There goes the image. And there goes the image. <laughs> I know, it's so easy. And of course, this is going to be on the internet. <laughs> In two and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what did well, I did yeah, not say? What? Yeah. I said honking, which is... Anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
I drink a lot of coffee, <laughs> uh, and I mean that is just simply my all I've ever done is uh, I, I drink a lot of coffee in the morning to uh, to sort of loosen everything up. And um, I go back to work. What, what time is the morning when you wake up, John? Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> ready for this. this. Relatively early. Relatively early. What, what, what do you mean by that, John? I'm usually up around three. Need to be some more. Okay, so I'm going to bed when John is waking up. Right. Most people are. But you know, uh, there's very little voice work that I do on the computer. So you know, I don't even I don't talk. I don't speak. Uh, I don't talk to the cat, I don't respond, I don't give it food. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just, I'm very, very quiet until, well actually I sometimes will call and yell at uh, Linda's kids for her. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he actually sends emails at that time too. And then he's like, by the time I get up, say 8 o'clock. I go onto my computer and there's like 30 emails from John. Did you get my email? Why have you not responded? <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I didn't say that's from the day before. Is there another question? Yes. Well, that was great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we oh, come on, there must be another question. Somebody's got to yeah, yeah, there we go. As the tech for recording has changed, has it gotten better or worse from your perspective? Oh, recording? Recording. Oh, unquestionably yeah. better. Uh, I, I, uh, I mean, uh, certainly I go back to the days when, when uh, tape was being cut with a razor blade uh, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a platform. I remember Joe Davidson, may he rest in peace, from, yeah, a dear, dear friend of all of ours. He was an engineer, a lovely, wonderful man. He had a callus on his thumb from doing this, you can't see, putting the two pieces together with a piece of splicing tape. He had this gigantic callus on his thumb. Oh, wow. Yeah, it was really an interesting, uh, interesting thing. But I remember days when they would edit a piece of audio tape and it would fall on the floor. But unfortunately, they might have been editing there for six hours. And it would fall into a pile of audio tape pieces all that length. And then they would have to go searching for it. And of course, they, there's no way to tell. You can't hold it up to the light. No matter what's going on. So you put it in, and, and the commercial would roll, or they do some copy would roll and say, and that's why we gosh, it's not it's not gosh, it's not. That's not the right piece. Uh, but technology today, in terms of from my end uh, now, being a voice, doing a lot of voice directing. It's magnificent. I can, I, I have had occasions when I've had a performer in and done, who's done uh, work, uh, they've left and we realize there's something missing. A word is missing. I've, I've, I've been able to, after the fact, pluralize a word because I'll say to the engineer, I gotta get the right S. He said, my brother, and I need my brothers. You can't just randomly take an S. But through today's technology, I can search for the right S that follows an, an R and slide it in and make it work. And it's, uh, it saves production companies money because of that, because there are always those little slips. Nobody's perfect and it's, things are always missed. But the ease with which I can move lines around and move words around occasionally, again, after the fact, is magnificent. And also the storage. There's yeah. no storage. It's all there. Right there on the hard drive. Any other question? Actually, I was more along the lines of the voice acting. Uh, the microphones are better. Is it the situation that y'all are in when you're doing the recording? The microphones are probably pretty close to the same, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Sound wise? Yeah, yeah, I would, I would say. And, and, and that's something that as an actor you don't really concern yourself with. Uh, you just hope that it sounds as, as, as good as possible and you've got your headsets on and as long as you can get a, a nice true rendition of what you're, uh, what you're performing and what you're hearing in your own ears. Uh, that's another thing. Sometimes you'll go into a studio and they will have just god-awful headsets and you're hearing yourself and you say, oh my god, I sound, this is awful, I sound terrible. And it's, it's, it's hard to perform that way because you have to hope that what they're getting in the, in, the, in the booth, in the studio, sorry, you're in the booth, but what they're getting in the studio is actually um, as 
good as it should be. And sometimes you actually have to block your ears because you're hearing something that sounds so foreign to you. But that's such a simple thing. That's just, you know, malfunctioning headsets or cheap headsets or headsets that are not plugged into the, the, the outlet that's the clearest. Um, but as for, you know, what John is saying, I mean, I can remember in the olden days, uh, um, especially when you're doing commercial copy, uh, you have to breathe. And you've got 30 seconds of copy to do, or 60 seconds. You're reading away, and it's always overwritten, and you're going, you know, blah, 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 blah. In those days, that breath was not allowed. And it was the hallmark of somebody who was really professional that he or she could get through that 30 or 60 seconds of copy without, you know. So you had to learn how to do snatch breaths all over the place because they weren't about to go in with the tape to remove, with, sorry, with their little um, blade. knife, blade, to remove a breath, a breath sound. It was too complicated, it was too hard, there wasn't enough time. And detectable, certainly. Was, yeah, and nowadays, Nowadays, your engineer, this little guy who's like 19 years old and he's really cute, you know, he's been, he's been sitting at a computer since he was two, and he, he sits there and you, and you say, well, hmm, now, uh, I'm going to have a little bit of a breath in here, and he says, no problem. Oh, can I put another one in here? You breathe as much as you want. You just breathe, 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 and I'll get rid of this in like three minutes, and boom, there you go. So what we have is we have spots. I've called them spots, the commercials, that sound maybe a little, ro not robotic, but a little less than human than normal, because nobody breathes. They just keep talking. And if you listen to it, listen to the next time you're listening to the radio or the TV, and say to yourself, listen to a 30 or 60 second spot done by, you know, one of your favorite announcers, and say, my God, that person is incredibly talented. They can read for 60 seconds without breathing. And it's because the engineers are, and the equipment is, are so fabulous. So it makes our job a little bit easier, um, a lot easier. And, and compressing as well. They can take something that's this long and make it this long. And your Which voice only sounds slightly higher. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add to it, if, you don't know, if I may, there are some performers who bring their own microphones. Microphones? To, uh, yeah. Who? Uh, I see the ones who bring your own headphones. I used to bring my own headphones to sessions, and a couple of other guys did. But there are guys who brought their own microphones. What? Yes. But so what did they say? This yeah. was, again, 80s, you know, in the 80s and 90s. What did they say? It was fine. I mean, I have my favorite kind of microphone. If I walk into a studio and they, they've got three different options, I'll, I'll say I want a U87. I, I mean, that's my microphone. That makes me sound the best. Mm -hmm. So, I, I have my preferences. Right, like I'm not a Sony. I just I say, Sony Sony just give me a gin and tonic and I'm good to go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's after she's yelled at her kids. <laughs> that would be the recurring. At nine o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. So, I could be wrong, but it's my understanding that Vancouver is kind of considered the Hollywood of Canada. What makes Toronto more of a destination for? Uh, cartoons or for dubbing and everything over Vancouver? Uh, primarily, talent pool. Uh, I mean, so Toronto is, is a major center. I don't know how many of you know it's the fourth largest um, city in North America. Um, that we just surpassed Chicago uh, as fourth largest. It's an enormous city. Uh, and the concentration of performers is certainly there. Vancouver is a good talent pool, but it's very, very small. Uh, and uh, the uh, Vancouver is a destination, yes, for Hollywood North in terms of filming, but they bring up a lot of your performers, a lot of American actors come up. It's a, you know, it's a hot flight. It's up the same coast. They can, they can, the execs can fly in for lunch and fly back the same day. Uh, and that makes it convenient in that way. In terms of animation, that isn't necessary, so they go to where the talent, uh, the, the major talent for is. Or they do a phone patch. For, yeah, they do very rarely for animation. Yeah, They'll do it if they have to. Phone patches, of course, I find, my experience is more in commercial work, mm, yeah. unless they want, like, if, if, if I or any of the other voice directors think want to, if they're using a, 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 an American star or something 
then we use voice patch because you don't fly them in. But animation is, is, is you know, they, you, generally you're in the studio for animation recording. Does that answer? Masked one. Interesting moments in the booth. In the what? In the booth. While recording. I had times when I, I, if I may, were, uh, and I think everybody has had this, and I think it's, 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 I don't know if it's a syndrome or not, but you get to a point sometimes where you can't say something. You can't pronounce a word. It's, it's the most common word. Now, I, I, I'll use one that, that I was using. We have a July 1st, north of the 49th, is called Canada Day. Now, Canada Day. It's hard. It's a hard word to say. And I was doing uh, some kind of festival thing, some big uh, festival or, or, or program that was going on for Canada. I think it's kind of hard to say. And, I, and it was very, very, it was a lot of coffee in a very short period of time. And I was having trouble saying Canada Day. But Canada Day. So that was. That was very, very frustrating. I must have done 30 takes. Oh. They said, they called me and said, last minute, got to get this done. It will only take you 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, it didn't. Suffice it to say, I was all apologetic. Not so apologetic that I said, you know what? Don't pay me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I ultimately got it, but it did take an hour for one 30 second break. So I'd be very embarrassed. I, um, I have three children. They're all like about a year and a half apart, which is great. Not so great when they're little. So I had a three-year-old, a one-and-a-half-year-old, and just gave birth, literally. I gave birth, and I was doing this campaign for Famous Players, which is a big um, movie theater uh, chain in Canada. And it was this great one where I was just doing this huge voice. It was almost like a guy voice in a strange way, but being read by a movie chat. You could stuff your sense with large, comfortable seats. And it was just huge. And it got bigger and bigger. And that, and to the end, I was just literally screaming at the end of this commercial. And it was a cool commercial. It sounded really neat. But the day that I gave birth to my third daughter, and I've got all these other daughters hanging all off me, all my little needy children, Three days after I had given birth, I get a call from my agent. Hi. Um, they wanted me to do um, a famous player's spot, but they just look, they, I'm like, I just gave birth. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, but they, they're literally, they just want you to do one line. Can you just go in to do one line? I'm like, uh, yes, of course I can't say no to any kind of word whatsoever. I went in there with the baby in the bucket. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I got the baby with me. And they're like, that's okay. I've got a three-day-old baby in a bucket. <laughs> and I'm apologizing to them. <laughs> so that's I, Canadians for yeah. <laughs> you. And I go in there and I'm like, okay, so, so here it is. And I said, okay, so it's just the one line, right? Okay, so what is it? And they said, oh, uh, well, we thought maybe we'd get you to do the, the body too, because it kind of changed a little bit. Okay, I've just given birth. I can barely stand up right now. I'm just like, oh my god, four hours. Four oh. hours of screaming. Thank you, God. <laughs> <laughs> We're like this now, baby God. <laughs> oh my god, it was so awful. Like partway through, uh, the baby just lay there. And then partway through, I said,
She brings her own dramatic effects. I do. <laughs> uh, so the voice reference is is uh, very very important. So you go in and it feels a little bit sniffly or you feel a little bit uh, coldy or you have a full blown cold and you go in and you start to do your lines and right away, you know, I think we should do a little voice reference here. It's not sounding good. You just they you, it. <laughs> you really start having it. So they start they play, you know, your your reference, your voice reference from say your audition or the first episode, and you could be like on episode nine or ten or whatever. So this is uh, it's frightening, and you listen to it and you realize that you're not, it's not happening. You're sounding nasal, congested, like you have to blow your nose, but whatever the fact, the thing is. So it's. Very, very frightening because they can just as easily say, you know what, you should go home, uh, and maybe we should just get you know, someone else to come in and do this. I mean, that's a rare thing. So we will avoid getting a cold at all costs. So this, if this means that you're supposed to get married on May 21st and your husband has a cold, you just phone and say, I'm sorry, the wedding's off. <laughs> you're gonna make me sick. And then I won't be able to, no, I'm making it, I, I'm, I'm you know, trivializing it, but that's how important it is. And so when friends come over, you know, well-meaning people, and they go, hi, how are you doing? Mwah, mwah, mwah. Oh, it's so good to see you. And you say, do I get a little cold in that nose of yours? Oh, yeah, I'm sick as a dog. Mwah, mwah. What? You just kissed me and touched me and you're sick and you're at my house? You know, it's funny, you kind of get a little bit uh, crazy and a little bit anal about it. Um, so, I don't know, you were talking about horror stories. I guess being sick in the booth and taking every drug known to man, every cold drug known to man, and of course then you can't read anymore. <laughs> oh my, oh gee, I sound great, but I can't read a bloody word. And uh, my throat and my mouth is so dry, I'm making all kinds of mouth sounds. So, you know, that's what they do, they dry out your mouth because they're drying out your nasal passages. And so the engineer will say, mmm, getting a lot of yeah, mouth sounds. Yeah, take a break, take a break. Take a break. Mouth sounds. That's the worst thing you can ever hear. You have to drink water. I've been drinking water for four hours, you guys. Take a drink of water. You're sounding a bit dry, okay. So, you want to know how to cure dry mouth? I worked with an old guy at CBC, he must have been 150 years old, and he said, I'm hearing some mouth sounds. And I go, mm. I have some pineapple juice, and that will fix it. I said, what? He said, water doesn't work. Water doesn't do anything to increase the mucus available in your mouth, which is basically what saliva is. Sorry? Oh, no, just to mucus and stuff. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Not one of my favorite topics. The saliva. <laughs> So he gave me a glass of pineapple juice, and it was perfect. Really? Pineapple juice. That's interesting. What about it? That's right. It works like a charm. Okay. And it's full of some kinds of enzymes, so maybe it just breaks it all down. I don't know, but you sound as clear as a bell. And really? it was after all the mouth sounds Sweet and unsweetened. It was unsweetened. He kept it in his fridge. Wow. Dole or? I'm just, you know, just the other thing is when you're in front of a microphone and they say to you, oh, do you have a cold? And you go, no. <laughs> and then you do another line or so, and then they say, yeah, I think you've got a cold. No, I don't. I'm not, I'm not, I feel fine. You're going, I feel fine, I feel fine. The next day you're like, oh. <laughs> I got a cold. <laughs> and they know it before you do it. <laughs> microphone does, though, filter out a little bit of nasal, I find. If you're just marginally nasal, I, I find that if you, if you have the, the right microphone settings, you can um, you can avoid sounding totally stuck. Yeah. Okay. I found that. Anyway. Questions? Moving on. Nobody? Really? Come, Come on. on. Yeah. There we go. So what's the hardest piece you've had to do? The hardest uh, actor you've had to get into? The hardest? Roll? The hardest roll? Yeah. Roll? <laughs> Sailor Moon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, mine was an, an animation character uh, that I, I did a number, a, number, a number of years ago. 
probably finished it about six years ago. I don't know if you're familiar with the series Red Wall. Uh, okay. Well, I, I, I did different, different characters. They ran three years. I was a different character every year. I was fortunate enough to be hired. And the third year, there was a character named Claude who had, uh, it was, I think, the most inventive voice that I've ever come up with. And it was with the help of, you know, Ray Jaffers? Yes. You know, Ray is a wonderful guy. Uh, and we worked on, on getting this voice for the character. And he was a he was a pirate, but they wanted him all to sound all sort of jolly and, and throaty. But and, but he also wanted him to sound sort of European, which I was working on that. And he said, now so I want him a little bit Scandinavian too. So I had to do that. And he was it. And it was this bizarre voice. And once I got it, well, I would I could I could do an episode because and, and it was like honestly like. I didn't want any interruption. I didn't, I didn't want water. I didn't want I didn't pee. Nothing. I just wanted to do the session while I could get it in my head. And without exception, every time I came back, because they did, they did 26 of them, and it was every two weeks that I would come in, so it was almost a year, I had to have a reference and listen. And I really, it wasn't just a matter of listening and saying, okay, I'm good, I'm good. But I had to actually work at getting it. Is Almost it? each element, bringing in each element at a time. And that was by far the toughest uh, task I've ever had. It was, you know, it's, it's wonderful. But, and I remember too, I would, seriously, every session I would be dripping with perspiration because mm -hmm. it was, it required a physicality, which a lot of, I, I, I always encourage, I teach as well, and I, I encourage physicality and when you're getting a, a voice because it, uh, it really, really does help. Because you think about what the animator is drawing, right? And you kind of physically do what the animator is going to draw. But I had to, but I was, I was really physical with this voice. And just an interesting experience. Mm -hmm. I hope I never have it again. <laughs> <laughs> Those are always ones that are most fun. I had one that I had to be uh, in Monster Math Squad. I was a little boy and a little girl, brother and sister team. And you know, they sort of wanted them to sort of sound a little bit alike they were twins, but they had to be more girly, one had to be more girly, and one had to be more boy, which is okay, that's fine. And normally what you would do is you do all the little boy part, and then you do all the little girl part. But this director decided, you know what we should do is, because we want it to sort of go next to each other, we want to make sure it sounds good together, do the little boy and the little girl at the same time. So I'm talking to myself. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and it was a really high octave. Hey, Monster Mask Squad, you know, you're talking like this. Oh, it's a great squad. And you go back and forth, and it was just, I was like, ah, ah, ah. <laughs> oh my god. And then they both say at the same time, or we're going to freak out. And I had to do both of those, and oh my god, my vocal cords are just like, <laughs> oh, it's awful. Now that's, that's really unusual. Usually if you do two characters in a show, they'll record one separately, completely separately, mm -hmm. so that they can be really nice and clean, because no matter what, you're obviously going to, you know, at the beginning of the sentence for the new character, you're, there's going to be a little element of the old character in there, no matter what you do. Um, it's, it's funny when you say difficult. Difficult for me often entails uh, challenging would be the different accents that you have to do. And, and one time I, I, was at, I was cast, God only knows what, though, I auditioned for it. They said, these are these like mythical creatures, I don't even remember the name of the cartoon, of the series. Um, but I was playing the Nomos, and she said they are spiritual creatures with a West African accent. Oh. And I said, well, of course you're asking me. <laughs> Of course, I mean, uh, the first person I, I must call Susan to do a West African accent because of that, I mean, that's in her bailiwick. No. So I go to, uh, there's a place in Toronto called Theatre Books, and there's a, 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 these old fashioned <laughs> cassettes that have this guy who tells you how to recreate a West African accent, which was an, an amazing thing because he was obviously from, you know, Dublin. <laughs> and listen to him, but he could do a great, he was very good with accents. And he would give you the technique of how you would do these certain dialects from around the world. So I listened to the tape and then I went in and I auditioned and believe it or not, I was given
give you the part of one of the nomos along with three people from Jamaica, because apparently a Jamaican accent is very, very close to a West African accent. So they sounded really authentic and I didn't. <laughs> so I had one key phrase that I was able to latch on to that kind of helped me get through the series, because I felt a little bogus. So my key phrase was, from my tape, and I think I do it very well. And the key phrase was, go, go to the bell back to. How's that? Does that sound right there? Right there? And, and he said, you have to make all your words come out of the front of your mouth. There's no back, back of the mouth kind of stuff. And you have to make your lips do the work. And it's not go, it's go, go. That was good. Go to the bell back to. So that I could do really well, but then they'd give me other lines that were not, <laughs> anyway, they weren't go, go. They weren't go, go. So it was uh, unbelievably challenging, and, and if that ever came on again, I would be afraid to listen to it. But anyway, you do what you have to do, do you anyway. <laughs> Next, someone had a, anybody with a first question before we go to a uh, second thing? That's all right, here's the we'll go break your hands. All right, um, I know in your last panel you were talking about uh, how you say about differently and how yes. it's going to be a challenge. Do you always have to plan for an American audience and get rid of that accent, or is it when it's in Canada you don't really plan on it? Just if it gets in America, it's always, yes. always. In fact, my kids even say out. Hmm? I, I gotta tell so you, you that, I, that it depends on the company. I, I, I've, I've done some stuff where they say, don't worry about it. Everything, understand that everything that's produced is in some way regional, okay? Everything's regional. And the very fact that some, that some stuff that, sound, that comes from Canada, kids aren't gonna really pick up and say, oh, the, this, they sound really funny, they're probably from Canada. Um, it, doesn't, it's, it doesn't really happen. Although, if you're doing, I have worked, I just finished a project for Disney, were called Ella the Elephant, and they were the most anal people I've ever encountered in terms of that. They would send back, we must have, uh, I'll tell you, 10 lines every show came back. For outs, abouts, uh, tomorrow, sorry, and, uh, right, and they wanted it really almost overpronounced. Uh, it over enunciated, it was to the point of foolishness. They were, I think personally, I think they were simply asserting their authority over, over the company that was producing it, just because they had to send notes back. But that that's extremely rare that they would really push it that hard. Most things are, you know, if you give them a delivery that's halfway in between, they're very, very happy. I think that's what most of us try to do is, Somewhere in between, to, so that we don't sound regionalized. Uh, I guess the, uh, the the term would be mid-Atlantic, which is somewhere neutral, somewhere in the middle, where nobody can point a finger and say, "Aha, you are from." I mean, if if if, if, if any of you who are native Texans would go in and do it in their natural reading, speaking voice, people would say, "They're from Texas." Right, you would be able to point it out. So we all try to neutralize anything that's got mass, got a mass appeal that goes to all over North America, which most things do today. You've got to neutralize. Just sit in the middle. Out in the bed. That's what you say. <laughs> yeah, we know. It's coming in the bed. <laughs> yeah. When I'm near my family, my accent really comes out. But I'm speaking normally, and I don't really notice it, but whenever I go to my family, I start sounding like a southern male, and it really like, comes out. Does that ever happen to you around certain people? Where is your, where is your family from? We're all from Texas. From around here? So it comes out strong? Especially towards my grandfather, because he used to live in the, in the country. Right. And it happens with me, my mother, my brother, it, it happens to all of us. I was wondering if it happened to you with some people as well. Well, Linda, I noticed when she gets drunk. Maybe not that step back. I got so weak. Oh. <laughs> Old and messy. You can barely make her out, but every time she rolls over in the ditch, she says something. No. <laughs> yeah, my mother's Scottish, so I find the Scottish accent 
pretty much the hardest one to do because I've heard it so much through her that I'm, I, I, I guess I'm harder on myself about it because I go, I hate a fake Scottish accent, I hate that. And my husband is Scottish and he doesn't sound Scottish now, but when he brings on a Scottish accent, it's like, whoa, look at it, it's, it's thick Scottish accent. So I find that really hard, but I, maybe, I think maybe when I hang out with my high school buddies, suddenly I'm more Canadian and I'm, I'm a little bit more, oh, shut up, get out of eh? Like, dumb, that's, that's dumb, what are you doing? So I think maybe I do that a little bit more, maybe, but you're, you're comfortable with that, so. I, then, so, you know, I, um, but I didn't, you know, I haven't really picked up any of a French accent because I'm not actually, um, yeah, a Francophone. But I've noticed that people who, it happens to everybody, and it just shows what incredible ears we all have, that someone will move to a city where there is a different accent or dialect going on, and you'll phone them two or three months after they've moved, and you'll go, who are you? And they will have picked up the general tone of the way people speak in that city. And it happens, I mean, I know people who, who moved to London, England, because they went to theater school there, and you follow them and you say, how's it going? And they'll say something like, well, I was just speaking with my aunt and my aunt asked me, I'm like, who are you? And they're not putting it on. It's because that's what they're hearing. And it sort of makes me realize, um, first of all, how talented we all are, which is, you know, a given, and how vulnerable and sensitive we all are to language. And that maybe, as you're saying, when you're with your family, you, you, because you know what? It's comfortable, isn't it? And, and that's, I think that's one of the, the most wonderful things about, about language and communication is when you find your comfort point uh, where everybody's in the same, in the, just in the same bailiwick, in the same groove. Um, and if, if, in this world, it's going by pretty quickly now, isn't it? Everything is so fast. And, Choppy, 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 and any time we can find a spot or a place in our hearts that, that, that makes us feel comfortable, we're going to go there. And if it means that your granddaddy talks like that, and you're going to talk that, like that right back to him, and I think your accents here are charming. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. they're <laughs> so really Oh, it's, they're beautiful, and they're all so different. It's all so soft. <laughs> and it's soft. It's, it's really not soft aggressive. And, it's, yeah. and there's so much... Um, warmth and hospitality that comes through. You know, an accent comes about because of certain situations, right? I mean, you don't just suddenly develop an accent for no reason at all. Why do what people in New Orleans have a little bit of a French uh, twist? It's because of the migration of the, you know, the, the, the French Canadians that, and, and French Americans, I suppose, uh, who, you know, head, headed on down there. So I'd like to know the origins of why people in Texas speak the way they do, because it's 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 lovely. Do you do you listen to accents on TV and stuff like that? Things that are supposed to be Southern and Texan. Do you just go, ooh? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah, because yeah. it's funny because yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> I would imagine that because it would drive me nuts too. But I we did um, a Thomas the Tank Engine movie. And you know the little British accents and these little English accents, and we had to go and meet Britt Alcock, who was the one who wrote all the Thomas books, and she's English. And uh, I was sort of like, I gotta meet her. Why do I have to meet her? I'm just gonna drive me over. And so my first thing I said was, Is the accent okay? And she's like, It's fine. What? You know, she's just like, oh, Don't even notice. It all sounds the same to me. That would drive me nuts if I was listening to be like, Ah. <laughs> so who's gonna do a perfect? Texas accent. What's a perfect Dallas accent? Who's got the perfect Dallas who's, accent? Who's third generation? <laughs> Dallas. Oh, go ahead. You, okay, go ahead. Stand up. Oh, okay. there we go. Hi, man. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Welcome to Texas. Very glad to meet y'all. Very glad that you're here. It's an honor to meet y'all. Especially all three of y'all. Oh, that's great. That's great. That's great. That's great. In fact, I was like, was rushing over here. Trying to try to get y'all's autographs, and I'm so excited that you're here. <laughs> I'm a diehard Sailor Moon fan. I'm just so excited and honored that you're here. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I'm about to cry. I'm just so excited. Oh, wow. That's amazing. You see, you know what? See, that's the y'all. That's the y'all. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for standing up and thank you for what you said. And, you know, it's just such a 
genuine thing going on. Is everything is so genuine here. Did George Bush really come from Texas? <laughs> <laughs> He's not from Texas. He's not from Texas? He's not from Texas. He's from Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, uh, I'm just blown away. Ten minutes, ten? we have time, we have ten minutes. Ten minutes? Somebody, for goodness sakes, yes. So, can you talk a little bit about maybe like one of the worst recording studios you've ever had to work in, and like one of the best you've ever had the opportunity to work on, or is there not much of a difference? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's changed to now. You know that for, for us, I, I, I've been called to, to work in studios over the last few years because of the, the advent of, of high tech. Anybody can record anywhere, really. You can have a, somebody can, can have a Mac laptop in, in, a, in a closet with a, a cheap mic and you, you record that. It's, it's really, in the, in the old days, well, studios were high efficiency units, they were all bathroom properly, the, the acoustics were right up to the top, it was, they were full service facilities, they were kind of a joy to go into. Oh, uh, they were lovely, they had, they had lounges, and they had your choice of coffee, and there was snacks. <laughs> It and sometimes you go into the ones that were like the uh, the ones where they have a symphony orchestra that could fit in there, and, yeah. you'd, and you'd be all by yourself. <laughs> and there'd be this yeah. entire giant room. And the sound that you had was just magnificent. Oh. So things have changed. Studios are much smaller now, generally speaking. There still are the wonderful big facilities. They're not used as much simply because, as, as, as Linda said, where they would have a symphony orchestra now, it's all it's all canned or it's synthetic. Uh, the trend back, though, I find, there are a couple of big rooms that have been created again in Toronto. Big floors for, for orchestras. Yeah. That there is, and of course this always happens, things go one way, and then they start coming back the other way because someone somewhere says, you know, I'm tired of this synthetic sound. I want a real violin and a real viola, and I want to... I want to hear a, a drummer, not a drum set in the back. And so that is just starting to come back now. So studios again are starting to morph. We're starting to get again a couple of larger studios, which means maybe there's going to be a little bit of a throwback, which will no longer be throwback, but it will be the new way again. Well, I, I, my favorite studio, not was uh, somewhere in a part of the city that I had um, never really been to, but I, I was booked by my agent. It was uh, totally legit. And I went there, and it was a house instead of a studio in, a, in like a, a building. And I walked into, I knocked on the door. The engineer came up from downstairs. To, to, he said, hi, you're Susan Romer. I said, yeah. And he said, I said, I'm here to do the blank, blank spot. And we went down into the basement, and we went to the back of the basement, and he showed me the spot, and I looked at it, and I said, okay, that's great, now where's the booth? And he paused for a second, and he said, well, it's just along the hallway, follow me. And he goes, think, 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 up the hallway, and then he opens the door, and he says, it's right in here, and I walked in, and it was the bathroom. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And I said, oh, <laughs> that's so funny. <laughs> Where's the studio? Where's the booth? He said, this is the booth. And he said, I take down this piece of wood, and he put the wood on top of the toilet seat. He said, you sit here. <laughs> I said, you know, what is the sound like in here? There's a lot of hard services. And so he took, he took uh, pieces of, you know, people who move furniture, they have those big, thick, quilty kind of things. So he draped the back of the tank in a quilt, he draped what I was sitting on, on a, with a quilt, and he draped the little sink that was right beside me with a quilt, and he brought in one of these and sat it in front of me, and I said, are you leaving the toilet paper right here? How handy. That's great, thank you. <laughs> so, he then closes the door, and he said, I'll speak to you through your headsets, and he walks back up the hallway, and I've got my headsets on, and I'm waving, and I said, Oh man, here I am, I'm sitting on a toilet in the bathroom, recording a spot. So anyway, uh, we did it and um, it sounded fine. <laughs> <laughs>
person at the door. A rap person. Well, after the foul language, I'm not surprised. <laughs> yes. So. All right. How much? Do we have a minute? We have five. Oh, sorry. Way back in the back. Guy with the green mic. Oh, that's a good song. Guy with the green mic. Can you come to sound like this point from My Little Pony? I sound like. This point from My Little Pony? Uh, no, I did not. Uh, I didn't do My Little Pony. Oh, you do sound like this point. Well, Congratulations, if I can pay for some residuals, I'll take them. <laughs> <laughs> hey, tell them there's a new phone. I'll just. I'll just uh, Call on our sarcastic one. Same guy! <laughs> Could you do Toad? Yes. Could you do Toad, Chris? I've already hit the floor! Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> do more. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> come on, Princess! I'll take you to the castle! Look at that! Yeah, just show my age there! Woohoo! <laughs>
going, oh, it was terrible. It all got, uh, I can't read, uh, it was terrible. It was, I completely shut down. And this was not just in grade school, this is in high school. This is all the way until I was 28 years old. And I was in theater school, and he said, okay, we're gonna be doing cold reads. And I was like, I just one of those teachers that I can't, I can't do it, I can't read out loud. And he said, well, then you better learn. <laughs> and I went, I don't know how, I don't know how, he said, you have to read. You, have to, you go home and you read out loud, that's what you do. And I would go home and I would read out loud, and I would read one word at a time. And it was so painful, even in my own home, reading out loud, that I would just be like, <sighs> but I kept doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and doing it, and then I learned how to read out loud. That's how you do it. Yeah, it was awful. I still, even still today, if I, if I get a cold read, I'm like, I just, Nope, they did not even have one. Folks, it's 8 o'clock. We have to wrap it up. We thank you all very much for coming. Yes. yes.